Camera speeding. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. And if you're new, welcome to my channel. My name is Stephanie Yates, Anya Buile, Stephanie for short. I'm a licensed associate marriage and family therapist. This channel is for fellow therapists, those who are thinking of becoming therapists, and those who are using therapy insight to create their best life. I think this video will be the most useful for those who are looking to create their best life, but can be very valuable for anyone who needs a refresher on attachment theory. Today, we'll be talking about the roots and impact of four different attachment styles. If you're curious, stay tuned. Attachment theory was formulated by John Bowlby. Later on, that work was continued by Mary Ainsworth. And it's basically the idea that our relationship with our primary caregivers, typically our mothers and fathers, those relationships really set the stage for the later relationships that we have in our life. From what we view as possible for us, what we view as safe, for our optimism, it can have a huge impact on our ability to connect with others or desire to trust others. Attachment is really thought of as kind of the foundation for all of our later relationships. And I've found with my clients especially that when we're having conversations, particularly around relationships in their life, whether they be work relationships, friend relationships, and especially romantic relationships, a lot of the ways that they interact with people who are important to them can be tied back to those earliest relationships that they experienced and they also can be tied to trauma. And so our attachment styles can definitely be heavily impacted by trauma, but today we will not be talking a lot about trauma. I can do a separate video on that if you'd like. Um, we'll be talking just specifically about the four different types of attachment styles that you'll see most often. So to set the stage, let's talk about the good attachment style, the one that we would like to think a majority of people have, and that is a secure attachment. With a secure your attachment, your relationship with your parents is based on a relationship where you can trust them to tend to your needs. Think as an infant, we are really highly dependent on our caregivers to survive. They have to feed us, they have to change us, they have to make sure that we're not in temperatures that would lead us to be sick. They have to really be attuned to us in a way where they know what our needs are and can meet those needs even without us being able to verbally communicate them to them, okay? So when you have a secure attachment, that typically means that your parents not only met those needs sufficiently that you had for basic survival, but also also met your emotional needs. If you cry, did they comfort you? Did they try to find you? Understand why you were crying? Did they try to snuggle with you? Try to cuddle you? Let you know that you're not alone if you're afraid or anxious as a baby? And we see that type of attachment where you've been responded to growing into the toddler years, where you're able to explore and crawl. When you've got that secure attachment, that parent represents a secure base for you. They can be in the same room and you feel comfortable crawling away to see touch things explore things because if some sort of danger presents itself you trust that that parent will provide you with the safety that you need to overcome that danger so even as babies as infants as toddlers we are learning whether or not we can trust people and so when you have a secure attachment essentially that parent represents security they also represent a safe haven so when you are feeling afraid or anxious or terrified, you can go to them and feel that they are able to protect you. So that is secure attachment. Now, let's talk about an attachment style that is something I often work with with my clients, which is an anxious attachment, okay? So in an anxious attachment, the support that the parent provides them is inconsistent. So they feel the need to hold on to that parent because they really don't know when the parent is going to return to take care of them, okay? So when you have a baby who's getting inconsistent support, they can become very clingy and needy, really clinging so that 
that we can have those needs met. We're doing anything to get attention and often not be soothed when that parent comes back. They'll still be crying. They'll still be anxious because their parent's presence alone doesn't necessarily represent any sort of safety or security for them. So in adulthood, what I see when I see adults who have this anxious attachment style, those are typically my adults where if a person hasn't texted them back, they're freaking out, they're anxious, they're thinking that person is going to abandon them. They're the kind of person that really tries to read between the lines. They might be easily hurt or offended and sensitive because they're always looking for cues that a person might reject them or reject their needs because that is their expectation. Their expectation from their earliest years was that you can trust a person but they might not consistently come through for you and give you the basic needs that they can provide you with. So that's what we see most often with anxious attachment. The next type of attachment I want to talk about is avoidant attachment. A person with avoidant attachment as a baby, if the parent left, they didn't respond. You don't see any emotional response from them. When a parent returns, that doesn't make them feel at ease. They don't feel comfortable just because their parent comes back, as you would expect with any baby who has a solid attachment with their parent. So what does this tell us? That when you have an adult who has that avoidant attachment style, they found that it is much safer not to let anyone in, not to trust anyone, not to let anyone see you sweat them instead of actually being vulnerable and trusting them. And this is what happens a lot of times when we are experiencing people where it seems like no matter what I do, they don't trust that I'm going to support them and be there for them. It's probably because experiences way past you has taught them that they shouldn't really let anyone in. What's interesting about this, it looks as though they don't care. They're not letting anyone in. They're not responding to that parent coming or going. But if you look at them physiologically, their heart rate increases, their cortisol, which is a big indicator of stress, those levels rise. We can see even with adrenaline that they are responding to the presence and absence of those important people. But you wouldn't be able to tell based on their responses. They're the kind of person that will just say things are just fine. It's whatever. They don't care because by showing that they care, they're showing vulnerability. And that is a huge sign of that avoidant attachment style. So one way that we see that avoidant attachment style erupting a lot of times is if you have parents who display avoidant attachment style as an adult. And those parents a lot of times can be resistant to things like cuddling or cooing, soothing the baby. Sometimes you encounter parents who really have a hard time with affection and intimacy themselves, um, especially depending on how the child came about. The child reminds them of a partner they're no longer with, for example. We can see that that parent might be avoidant in the way that they parent that child, not very in tune with them. And that child can respond by not knowing how to do those things themselves. And they don't look to people for connection in the same way that a person with a more secure attachment would. So that is another one that I see all the time. And typically what I'm working with my clients on in that case is starting to focus more on evidence. Has this person shown you that they are a liar? Have they shown you that they don't have your best interest at heart? And those are some of the exercises that we'll do to just kind of challenge that innate desire to just push people away and keep yourself safe. Now, the last attachment style that we're going to talk about is disorganized attachment. And this is the wild card. This came up several years after the first three were identified. And disorganized attachment really means we can't account for it. And that is where trauma often is what can impact the way that we're able to connect with others. A child might be completely secure in their attachment growing up, and then maybe their parents die unexpectedly, or maybe they experience some sort of trauma that their parents were not able to protect them from. You might have a child that is experiencing some sort of distress, whether it be that they need a bottle or maybe they feel lonely. Maybe they're being left with a babysitter and they're afraid to be with this new person. And instead of trying to soothe that baby as you might with the secure attachment. What we see with this organized attachment is usually that parent is yelling at the child. So the child is already distressed. They're already afraid and scared. And the parent's response is to match those negative emotions by screaming or ignoring the child or leaving them. Different things that communicate to that child. When I'm in danger, my parent is unconcerned or actually presenting more danger. 
especially in the cases where you have the parent as the source of trauma. So if the parent is the abuser, for example, and a child is simultaneously learning, I'm dependent on this person for survival. They're the ones that feed me. They're the ones that house me, but they're also the person inflicting the most pain and scaring me the most. That's going to lead to a disorganized attachment style. And that's where often we'll see those types of patterns being repeated generationally. And so by the time you have your own children or your own spouse, you end up inflicting some of the same pain that you felt because that's been your lesson and how you connect with people. You've learned that you can be both a source of comfort and a source of fear. So when we utilize fear tactics to get people to do what we want them to do, including children, a lot of times what we're doing is contributing to an attachment style that can negatively affect the way that they connect with others all the way throughout their adult life. I thought this would be a good topic because it's kind coming up in so many of my sessions. Attachment really underlies so many of the problems that we can see within relationships. And there has been debate about whether or not an attachment style can be changed. I'm one of those that believes that if you are aware of your attachment style, if you are seeking help to identify your triggers and to see where you learned how to behave or how to interact in certain ways, I truly believe and have seen where people have been able to work against or counteract those natural tendencies of interacting with people. It does take a lot of work because you're basically teaching yourself from scratch. You didn't learn how to create a safe environment for someone, how to trust someone, how to represent a secure base for someone else to explore or how to even explore on your own. And so you have to be a bit more cognizant, but I do believe that it's possible to make choices that are not in alignment with negative attacks attachment styles. So if you have other questions about attachment styles or other topics that you would like me to cover, please put those in the comments below. Again, my name is Stephanie Yates Anyabwile, Steph Anya for short. I ask that you subscribe to my channel, click the bell notification so that you know each time I upload a video, like this video, and I ask that you share this video with anyone that you think could find it useful so that they can find the channel and let me know if there are topics that they would like to have covered too. I appreciate you for watching all the way until the end of the video. That really, really helps me. Thank you.